You know what that means. It's time for Soapbox Social. Coming on the heels of the state of Oregon ending its drug decriminalization program, political pressure is on for BC to halt its own decrim pilot project. So with us here in studio now to discuss all of this and more is our Soapbox Social panel. Kyla Lee is a Vancouver criminal lawyer uh, for Acumen Law Corporation. And Mo Amir is the host of the podcast, This is Van Color. Welcome to you both. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Okay, let's just talk about sort of recent events when we talk about decrim, Kyla. Three Metro Vancouver city councillors, they're banding together, talking to their councils, uh, calling on the BC government to end our decriminalization pilot project. What, what do you think? I think it's a terrible idea. I don't think that anything good is going to come from ending decriminalization. I think we've looked at uh, all of the wrong information in arriving at the conclusion that this isn't working. We have looked at this so-called problem of the uh, regulated substances that people are accessing through safe supply, quote unquote, flooding the streets without actually looking at the data that goes back. If you look at some data that's been uh, identified, it actually shows that the, the rate of these regulated substances entering the streets occurred well before we had safe supply being prescribed. So if we have concerns about those types of things, we have other mechanisms to address them. Eliminating decriminalization is only going to put more lives at risk. It's only going to further burden the court systems, and it's going to lead to more arrests of the most marginalized people and not stop the problem of drug deaths. You know, we had a conversation yesterday with, with a researcher out of Oregon. His name is Corey Davis, a uh, senior investigator for a study into decriminalization there. And, you know, mm. they've started to turn things around there. Um, here's a little about what he had to say about, they call it their Measure 110. This is the legislation that decriminalized drugs in that state. Our research tried to answer the question of, does it seem to be Measure 110 um, that was causing the increase in overdose deaths. And we found that, you know, we didn't find any evidence for that. You know, it's very likely the result of the infiltration of, of fentanyls and, and car fentanyls along the West Coast of both the United States and Canada. Right. Okay. So that was the researcher in, in Oregon State. Mo, what goes through your mind when you hear that? Well, I think the reality is that decriminalization wasn't meant to necessarily solve the drug overdose problem. What it was meant to do was take drug use out of the criminal justice system and put it into the healthcare system. Decriminalization effectively limits the amount of police interactions with people just using drugs uh, on their person or whatever. Um, and it did accomplish that. You know, that, that certainly went down. So when you talk to drug user advocates and harm reduction advocates, they, they say that, in a sense, decrim was successful. Now, Attached to decrim, they should have had a lot of other support resources, and that includes things like more safe consumption sites. That includes things like greater access to safe supply to things which Oregon didn't have. So to look at decriminalization and pretend like it was a silver bullet is just being disingenuous because I don't think anyone was necessarily promising that. And I do think that the government failed in communicating what decriminalization is and what it's supposed to accomplish and how it can be built out. And, and I think that's really the, the failure in this case. Um, you can't look at street disorder and say, oh, this is because of decriminalization, because ultimately, what is the alternative? We're just going to lock up people for using drugs. We're going to push them into dark corners where they use alone and, and are at greater risk of dying. Like, I don't think that that is a sustainable solution either. So these uh, vehement critics to decriminalization, I think we're always critics of decriminalization, and they're latching onto things uh, without actually looking at the policy and what can be done to broaden it out and make it successful. Well, still, Kyla, we have heard from Vancouver's police, uh, Vancouver Police Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson. She testified at the House of Commons uh, Health Committee, hearing about how the pilot is is limiting how police can respond to, let's say, problematic public drug use. You know, something that Mo was just describing. What, what do you make of that? I mean, I'd like to applaud the Vancouver Police Department for being great at spinning a narrative in relation to this, because that's the only thing that they're doing well. At the end of the day, the, the police shouldn't be the people to deal with problematic drug use. Yes, there are incidents that happen maybe as a result of people who are on drugs who might be having a bad reaction or have taken too much who cause a problem. But that should be dealt with properly as a health issue, not as a policing issue. And if we sort of it's like treating everything um, 
like a nail because the only tool we have is a hammer. And that's the way the police are dealing with this. But they have this great sort of spin machine that allows them to get the ear of very powerful people. They have the ear of the mayor and the support of the mayor in, in this city. And that's getting them a lot of traction on this narrative rather than, like Mo says, focusing on the issue with the proper methods to deal with the problem. And we've seen this narrative before. I mean, when, when Insight came online, there were a lot of people blaming the rise of homelessness on Insight as well. So, I mean, I, I would agree with Kyla, and, I, and again, I would emphasize that point, is that while police have a very uh, important responsibility in our communities, they're not health care experts. And again, the whole point of decriminalization was to put drug use into the health care sphere. Well, something else we heard from Corey Davis. So, so uh, Oregon hasn't completely gone back to square one with, with this. They, they've adopted some legislation that they consider kind of a middle ground here. So where do you see the middle ground, Mo? Where do I see the middle ground? I mean, I, I think we need more services and more health care services for people. I think that's the middle ground. We do need safe consumption sites. We do need greater access to safe supply. And we need a, a vested interest in, one, keeping people alive, but then, two, connecting them into the health care system. And this whole thing about, oh, you, you can't bring drugs into a hospital – well, you know, you can't smoke inside a hospital as well, but if you drop your pack of cigarettes, no one's going to kick you out of the hospital. I'm not saying that you should be smoking meth or, or doing drugs within a hospital that's harming other patients, but but we have to look at this a little more realistically and without the, the politicalization that we're seeing from a lot of political parties right now. I'll bet we'll still hear more oh, sure, politicalization of, of it, but let's move <laughs> on here. Kyla, how are you feeling about Premier David Eby teaming up with social media companies like, like Meta, TikTok, X, uh, working together on tangible steps to protect people from online harm. He's, he's kind of backing off from the initial challenge. Is he backing off or did he use social media and online pressure to pressure the social media companies to come to the table and act, actually work with him? I mean, it's kind of good, a little bit of online bullying. Good, good tactics. Now, I mean, if, if, it, if it works, ultimately. <laughs> if it works, great. And I think that cooperation is much better than legislation. You know, again, we don't need a hammer when we can work with these social media companies. They have a vested interest in continuing to have as many users on their platform and as much of a broad operation in British Columbia and across Canada and across the world because that's how they make money. So if the government can work with them to keep young people safe, to stop the prevalence of online bullying, you know, as somebody who's been bullied online, I think that this is, you know, a good step in the right direction. Mo, how do you see it? I mean, I would agree to a certain point that, yeah, I think collaboration is good. Certainly there was pressure on those social media companies to come to the table but he could have got a lot more. I mean, he could have said that, okay, we're going to redraft this bill or we're going to make it look slightly different to uh, either accommodate these concerns but still be able to hold them accountable. We also have to remember that right now Meta has a ban on Canadian news sites where you can't post links. I mean, he had that to maybe say, listen, we need, these, we need the ban to be lifted during wildfire season because we need – and we need this promise. I know that Meta kind of indicated that they might do it, but I think he could have leveraged that a little more uh, because clearly they were feeling the pressure. I think uh, Bob Mackin at the, the Breaker News pointed out that Mark Zuckerberg had actually registered as a lobbyist um, in March of this year once once this was going through. So I think he had a lot more that he could have um, he could have pressured them to do. Right. Well, uh, Kyle, it's interesting. At the time of his introduction to this bill, and I know things have, have changed somewhat since then, but David Eby compared the harms done by social media to those caused by tobacco and opioids. What do you make of that comparison? I mean, I had a pretty big eye roll when I heard that comparison, I'm not going to lie, because I think it's, you know, it's very easy to track the harms caused by opioid addiction um, from, you know, uh, the companies that manufacture the opioids underselling their addictive qualities. It's very easy to quantify the harms that were caused by cigarette smoking. We know about the cancers that are caused by cigarettes and the, and the um, illnesses that come as a result. But you can't really quantify the harms caused by social media. You can't say that because somebody suffers from depression, and that was because of online bullying and not that they were a person that was predisposed to depression who experienced online bullying because they were maybe putting themselves out in a vulnerable position online. So I, I, I had a little bit of a, a, a chuckle at how difficult it would be to prove the causation element of it. But I mean, at the end of the day, there's definitely harms that come from online activity. And, you know, it, it is worth holding these companies to a better standard in protecting their users. Okay. 
Nicely done. Um, let's move on to the Canucks playoffs, shall we? And where people are going to be watching the games. I mean, we know the bars and the restaurants are are just packed. absolutely packed. They're yeah. very, very happy about that. You can pay fifteen dollars to go to Rogers Arena tomorrow and uh, watch the, the away game. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to Delta. There's an outdoor viewing party in Delta. But what about Vancouver? What do we need to do to get an outdoor watch party in Vancouver? Or should we even be considering that, Malt? I somewhat agree with uh, Mayor Ken Sim is that we have a bit of a history here in Vancouver. And so I do think that Vancouver has to prove that we can handle ourselves. And so what I think needs to be done is the Vancouver Canucks need to make the finals one year and we need to have one year where we don't riot. And then after that, we can have um, outdoor viewing parties. And so I'm putting the pressure on the Vancouver Canucks that they, they need to bring it home for us so we can have this in the future. Where are you watching the game tomorrow? At home. At home. <laughs> Safely <laughs> at home. Okay, so you're, you're serving the drinks, you've got the snacks yeah. happening, that's all happening. What about for you, Kyla? What, what do you think about uh, the potential? I mean, you could see the mayor walking very, very gingerly over those questions today. Yeah, he didn't walk with swagger over those questions. <laughs> but I have a modest proposal. Uh, it's like the purge, but just for hockey. So anytime Vancouver makes the final or any Canadian team makes the final, all laws are suspended for that night <laughs> so that we can continue our strong Canadian tradition of rioting after game seven. <laughs> I just lean I into it. Yeah. I lean still in. have the images of the tuxedo rental shop across the street and mannequins coming out, and oh my goodness, it all just seems oh too fresh. Yeah. Yeah, too fresh. Too fresh. I know. But maybe one day, one 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 year we'll all, do it. All the same. You're watching the game tomorrow, Kyla? Uh most likely, yes. Okay. Hey, listen, good to see you both. Good to see you. Okay. See you. <laughs> that is our soapbox social panel. Kyla Lee, criminal lawyer for Acumen Law Corporation. Mo Amir is the host of the This Is Van Color podcast. If you'd like to weigh in on anything we were talking about today, especially on the potential for an outdoor viewing party in Vancouver, I'd love to hear from you on the coast at cbc.ca.